coming. We have a wonderful program today, a very exciting program. <clears throat> I'm going to start this morning uh, with the session on national security. Uh, then we're going to move to a talk from Michael Post, talking about living as a cyborg. And then we're going to have a series of oral presentations of the abstracts before lunch today. Uh, so she won't drink French. She has to vary. She has no choice. It's very uh, uh, it's an informative set of morning sessions. And so we're going to begin now. Uh, a moderator for this morning's session, Dr. Jadaram, is the assistant professor of clinical science and psychiatry in the division of ethics and health policy at UT Southwestern Medical Center. Fabrice. Well, good morning. I think we're going to have a very interesting uh, panel. We have outstanding uh, panelists uh, today. So just in terms of logistics, what we're going to do is we're going to allow the three uh, uh, speakers to present for 10 to 12 minutes, and then uh, I'll open the floor for uh, questions. So the general theme of this panel uh, will focus, focus on issues related to the transition from military applications of neurotechnologies to their public consumption. And the question is how to critically evaluate the implication of these emerging technologies without compromising, <coughs> excuse me, national security. So to this end, we have, first we're gonna have uh, Dr. Uh, Jonathan Moreno, is Professor of Medical Ethics and Health Policy of History and Sociology of Science and of uh, Philosophy at the University of Pennsylvania. In 2008-2009, he served as a member of President Barack Obama's transition team. Dr. Moreno is an elected member of the Institute of Medicine, the National Academy of Science, and is a national associate of the National Research Council. He has served as a senior staff member for three presidential advisory commissions, including the current Bioethics Commission under President Obama. He has also given invited testimony for both houses of Congress. He advises various science, health, and national security agencies and serves as a member of the Defense Intelligence Agency Tiger Com Committee on potentially disruptive novel technologies. Then we're going to have uh, Dr. Giordano. He is the director of the Center for Neurotechnology Studies and vice president for academic programs at the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies. He is research professor of neuroscience and ethics in the Department of Electrical and Computational Engineering at the University of New Mexico, Albuquerque. He is also research associate of the Oxford Center for Neuroethics. His ongoing research and work addresses the capabilities and limitations of neurotechnologies in medicine, public life, and national security and defense, and the neuroethical issues that arise in and from such research and its applications. Last but not least, Dr. Casebeer uh, is program manager in the Defense Sciences Office at the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency called DARPA. His research interests include neuroethics, the evolution of morality, the intersection of cognitive science and national security policy, philosophy of mind, and military ethics. Before joining DARPA, Dr. Casabir was the deputy head of the John Werfer Analysis Center's Technology Advancement de uh, Department. A retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel, his most recent intelligent assignment was as the chief of Eurasian Intelligence Analysis at NATO's military headquarters. So we have outstanding panelists, so without further ado, I will allow Dr. Um, Moreno. Thank you and good morning. Uh, it's so lovely to be the one to wake you up this morning. Uh, it, it's, it's also a lot of fun to be on a panel with Jim and Bill. We seem to be uh, ending up with each other a lot these days. Uh, Jim, by the way, has a fantastic new paper. Maybe it'll come up in our discussion later. And Bill, uh, I, I could tell you what he does, but then he'd have to kill you. So <laughs> I'm not going to go there. Uh, it is especially uh, historically noteworthy that we're actually having this session in this building. Uh, the, the history of science buffs know that so many of the important decisions made during uh, President Roosevelt's administration about science during the Second World War were made in this building, uh, including uh, decisions that had to do with uh, atomic weapons. 
Uh, and here we are in the, in the age of biology, uh, rather than the age of emerging physics. And uh, we're back. We're back to national security issues now in a different way. So uh, five years ago, I published a book called Mind Wars uh, about uh, brain research and national defense. Uh, this is Joe Finns, I think, in his review, who said it. This may not be the best book, but it is the first one. So thanks, Joe. Uh, <laughs> that was a really encouraging review. Uh, so I, I'm trying to do a little bit better now. Uh, so I, so th I've just uh, spent some time this summer updating and revising Mind Wars. Lots happened in five years, both in the neuroscience and in the uh, policy. So are you ready for the new cover? Yeah, this is exciting. Right, so that's the new cover. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> it was not my idea, but uh, <laughs> I think the marketers came up with something rather dramatic. <laughs> don't, don't pull that lever. Um, big splat. Anyway, so that's, uh, that will be out uh, next spring. Uh, but the book still starts with history since, uh, frankly, I like history more than ethics. I know it was never too good at the ethics anyway. Uh, just reminding people that there is a very interesting uh, uh, pre-neuroscience, I would say, uh, history about the role of national security agencies' uh, interest in the brain and behavior. So this, of course, is a scene from The Manchurian Candidate, uh, Frank Sinatra uh, being brainwashed into thinking that he can sing. Uh, and over here uh, is Uncle Joe. And uh, of course, I told my class uh, Tuesday night that I, I actually wanted to teach a whole class on LSD, but I think they, they took it the wrong way. But I, uh, <laughs> they think I'm on LSD anyway. Uh, but it's noteworthy that uh, people who uh, had meetings in this room in the 50s were also very interested in national security and the brain, uh, including in particular Alan Dulles, uh, who commissioned a report, much of which is on the web, some redacted, some most, much of it not, uh, on what happened to our POWs in North Korea and whether uh, hallucinogens like LSD were involved. And of course, there's a very fascinating history of the uh, intelligence agency's role in early uh, hallucinogenic experiments, and then, of course, we went from, uh, from Dulles to Timothy Leary uh, and the iconic drug of the 1960s and a certain generation that will be unnamed. Um, worth uh, noting, though, that I think all, all, we often think that, uh, that uh, there's a one-way street from sort of science into the national security domain, but this is a case in which there was science, national security, and then into popular culture. And I think that actually uh, a lot of us are in this room are probably thought about that. I think Mike Charles probably thought about that a lot, about the way that uh, these innovations become part of the popular culture, and they come through uh, the national security world as well. And of course, uh, nothing is sacred. J.B. Ryan, uh, who tried to uh, use uh, systematic studies to show that uh, there is such a thing as ESP, uh, coined the term psychological operations, was himself uh, CIA-supported starting in 1952, as we now know. And I just want to read this to you. This is from our colleagues in 1988 from the National Research Council about the mind race. Uh, and this was a, a report, as you can see, on enhanced human performance uh, from 1988, not so long ago. The claimed phenomena and applications presented by several military officers range from the incredible to the outrageously incredible. The anti-missile time warp, for example, is somehow supposed to deflect attack from nuclear warheads so that they will transcend time and explode among the ancient dinosaurs. Now, time out. Uh, I read that story by Philip K. Dick when I was, I think, 13, and uh, my understanding is that if you did that, that we wouldn't be here. So I guess they didn't read that story. Uh, one suggested application, more back to neuroscience now, is a conception of the First Earth Battalion made up of warrior monks, including the use of ESP, leaving their bodies at will, levitating, psychic healing, and walking through walls. Now, I, I commend this report to you. It's on the web. You can go to National Academies Press and read it. Um, you'll be happy to know that our colleagues of the late 80s did discourage the, the, the Army from uh, doing a lot more of this kind of work. Uh, so uh, I think they made the right decision. Of course, there was a film about this called The Men Who Stare at Goats. This is George Clooney uh, murdering a, a, a goat using uh, telekinesis. And the story is uh, that actually a goat did collapse at one point when this was going on. And they thought, well, you know, sometimes the magic works. So, um, however, there, uh, there's a lot of work that's been done recently. This is a, I, I went back, and by the way, the axes are mislabeled. Sorry, I'm only a philosopher. Uh, but you'll get the general idea. Uh, I went back to look at the web of science before and after 9-11, and I put in a bunch of keywords. 
uh, to see if I could come up with any patterns with respect to the funding of neuroscience after 9-11. And you pretty much see where the curve goes. Um, clearly, there is, a, uh, at least in terms of publication rate, a measurable intensification of interest in, in the brain uh, after 9-11. And I think this is, uh, you know, this is, this is evidence of something. Uh, and I think it, it is evidence that there's qu uh, quite a bit more interest now. So perhaps I, my, my hypothesis is that uh, by the late 80s, that enhancing human performance study, there was kind of a dip in interest in the brain. It didn't look like there was much to be learned uh, from about telekinesis. Uh, and then uh, there was an upsurge after 9-11, not surprising. So according to a colleague, Martha Kosol at Georgia Tech, you know, this is the money that's, that's been allocated in fiscal year 2011 for neuroscience funding uh, by the Army, Navy, Air Force, and uh, at least this much uh, by DARPA. So this is not, not a lot of money. Uh, of course, the United States doesn't really have any money anymore, but if we did, it wouldn't be a lot of money. Uh, but it is a substantial amount of money with respect to, I think, the kinds of influence that these agencies can have on what kind of uh, uh, routes are pursued in, in neuroscience. So just to remind you that there are lots of different things going on here in Badafinil. I'm not going to ask how many of you are uh, carrying around your provigil this morning, uh, planning to take it to maintain your alertness. Uh, during some of the talks, presumably not our panel, um, but clearly a possible replacement or at least supplement for amphetamines being used already. Um, our, our colleague Anjan Chatterjee at Penn, the neurologist, likes to say that uh, his prescription for uh, his patients who are traveling ac across a lot of time zones uh, is uh, Ambien when you get on the plane and Modafinil when you get off the plane. So if you don't know much about Modafinil, I don't have, to, I don't have time and I'm not awake enough to tell you, uh, but you can Google it, uh, and it's going to go off patent, I think, if I'm not mistaken, in a couple of years. Uh, so there will be a whole bunch of generic modafinil around, and there are certainly uh, people at the universities that we work in who are uh, part of the gray market of uh, modafinil. Uh, approved for narcolepsy, uh, but uh, uh, like other drugs, a um, whole bunch more of it's being made than probably necessary for clinical purposes. Uh, very interesting work, as many of you know, going on with oxytocin. Uh, started with Paul Zak uh, out at Claremont. Uh, the question is whether um, oxytocin is associated with the letdown reflex, with trust behavior, with a lot, does a lot uh, in our interpersonal relationships to make us more comfortable, uh, to help to socialize us. The question is, could you artificially administer oxytocin so that you would uh, be more uh, compliant in competitive situations? And there is some evidence, you know, much of it coming uh, out of Switzerland, uh, that uh, if you do this, then uh, you can people make more compliant in competitive gaming sorts of negotiation situations. Questions have been raised. Could you give this uh, in, in interrogations so that uh, you know the next the next person who came in the room would be the good cop, whether he or she was a good cop or not? Uh, and uh, just a sort of a, a footnote here: um, if you if even if this worked, this would probably be a violation of the Chemical Weapons Convention uh, if it were used for interrogation in. Uh, in, for example, in the war, in the what we used to call the war on terror. Uh, by the way, this is what oxytocin looks like. This is this is what love looks like up here on the upper right corner. Uh, it's a little disappointing, um, but uh, you know we are here to deflate your fantasies. Another question has been raised also in, in the pharmacology world about uh, beta blockers and whether they can be used to treat uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, there's apparently some evidence that they might be helpful along with talk therapy. It's not a very strong signal. Uh, um, some people have hypothesized that if that could work, could you also give it prophylactically before you send a warfighter into a combat situation, um, reduce guilt feelings, but would we then have a cohort, a generation of guilt-free soldiers coming back from combat? Uh, the people I've spoken to uh, uh, say that, uh, who work on this say that it really doesn't work that way, you can't do that, but uh, have not, uh, these folks have not put aside the possibility that some ingenious scientists couldn't come up with a way to find a molecule that could do this. And so we may, in, in fact, face that question. Uh, so I'm not going to uh, belabor the fact that we have all kinds of ways of looking inside the brain. Uh, there are all kinds of claims that are made about uh, the brain, that we can tell whether your brain is moral, that we can tell whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, a conservative or a liberal. Um, I don't know what to think. I know that we are, there are colleagues in this room who are skeptical about these claims, uh, but they are provocative and they keep selling books which is certainly you know, good for some of us. A few years ago, DARPA had a project called the Head Web, uh, which doesn't seem to be, uh, I, I guess it, the, the, the DAR, that particular project doesn't seem to be in, 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 in function anymore, but uh, the question is whether you could 
have a kind of a dual-use cap that could amplify uh, the signals coming out of the brain, uh, perhaps transmit them wirelessly to a, a somebody who's uh, who's keeping track of how somebody is doing in the field. Um, the work of Jack Gallant and colleagues, very provocative. This is already three years old, but uh, the notion that you can, um, use, using what we know about the visual cortex, that you can actually tell what, some, what image somebody is looking at up to a 92% accuracy. Gallant has more recently actually uh, uh, created some digital images of uh, people's thoughts about, uh, about certain objects, and they are pretty provocative. Um, but he's using the visual cortex, about which I'm told a lot is already known, so maybe it's cheating a little bit. Um, maybe you can't do this. It might be harder to, re to reproduce odor, for example, uh, than a visual image using uh, really fast computers. I think that would be a little bit different. But uh, and very provocative stuff. And this was one uh, news report of uh, what uh, Gallant and colleagues are doing in Berkeley uh, that uh, has gotten a lot of attention. So. Um, Moving now uh, more to the, to the device world, and uh, clearly there are a lot of reasons for us to be interested in brain-machine interfaces these days. I think probably Governor Perry would be particularly interested in something that would give him an interface with, a, with his uh, iPhone so he could remember his lists. Um, so this is a project that was done uh, by DARPA at my, uh, one of the medical schools that, uh, where I used to teach, SUNY Brooklyn. Uh, the RoboRat got a lot of attention a few years ago. Uh, some of you may be old enough to remember the RoboRat, uh, turning a rat basically into a kind of automaton. Um, what's, what, uh, so the idea here is very interesting as kind of a proof of concept that you could use a, a, a mammal and make it war, war, walk in certain ways and you know, given uh, the fact that uh, a, a rat can go through a hole about the size of a quarter, uh, you might be able to use it to see if anybody's uh, trapped in a building that's collapsed and so forth. Um, what struck me about it was that these were people who actually brought rats to Brooklyn. So, so I think that's a, <coughs> a tribute to science and a calls to Newcastle. Um, um, not only, of course, can we look inside the brain and manage the brain, there are also new ways of, of working on the brain in terms of neuromodulation or neurostimulation. I'm particularly interested in transcranial magnetic stimulation. Some people in this room are working on it. Uh, there are hundreds of, of studies of transcranial magnetic stimulation. Studies may be a little bit of an exaggeration. There are lots of uses of transcranial magnetic stimulation. The clinical setting uh, approved uh, for people who have depression that's refractory to medication. But there's some very interesting things that are done with TMS. Uh, and of course, we all, we all know the Nicolilis work. Uh, now it's, this is standard stuff, and people are doing it, of course, now with patients with locked-in syndrome and uh, who have quadriplegia. Um, and uh, more recently, the, the, the BrainGate project, which is a very sophisticated example of uh, a company that's moving ahead with brain-machine interface. Uh, all of this of, of, of great interest, not only here, but in the UK. Um, so. Uh, uh, this is a scientist in, in the UK who's uh, called uh, uh, Mr. Cyborg, uh, who hooked himself up uh, to his wife wirelessly, and when he has a thought, uh, she gets a, a buzz in the ba around her neck, apparently. Uh, I guess that's uh, helpful in some ways. Um, but there are lots of sort of, uh, you know, uh, hip ways of, uh, of making these demonstrations. Uh, when I was in the UK uh, in May, I also met uh, an American named Jamie Tyler. Jamie is an example of somebody who thinks that some of the older technologies that we might not, not have thought would work very well uh, are actually very promising. Uh, Jamie is now, used to be at Arizona State, he's now at Virginia Tech, and he is working on ultrasound, and he thinks that we uh, ought not to give up on the possibility that you could amplify brain signals using ultrasound, uh, which would obviously be a very non-invasive way of finding out what's going on and maybe using it. Uh, and this is just an image from uh, some of the work that uh, Jamie is using using ultrasonic brain machine interfaces. I think there are lots of lots of these technologies that are perhaps on the shelf and been underestimated uh, that might turn out to be promising and and the new work that uh, you know, my colleague John Wolf at Penn has been teaching me about uh, being done uh, by people in California originally uh, optogenetics very provocative uh, and I think we're going to be hearing a lot more about optogenetics both as a way of following what's going on and the connections among neural cells but also uh, as a way of uh, controlling the communications among cells, which is something that people haven't been able to do before. So, uh, ethical principles, well, here are two that we can uh, kick around. Um, should we insist on cognitive liberty? Does it make sense to say that only my brain, thought, my thoughts should only be my thoughts? Nobody should have access to my thoughts except me. Uh, is that even, in terms of evolutionary biology, does that even make sense? Uh, we have each, access to each other's thoughts and lots of ways that we're not fully aware of, and we respond to each other. That's what makes interpersonal relations possible. 
Um, and should it all, and when we're, we're, particularly when we're exposing the first folks to uh, these kinds of interventions, uh, should there be a principle of reversibility? But we don't always know that they're reversible. Uh, but we do, I think we, we, we talk a lot more, and I, I'm the first one to confess that I'm among this crowd. I talk a lot more about the cool new stuff without thinking enough about the ethical questions. And we're really not very sophisticated yet, I think, in thinking about this specifically, the ethics of neuroscience. Uh, I've been reminded in international meetings more than I have, I, I must say, at US meetings, that there is international law that covers uh, these kinds of activities, uh, human rights law, human, the humanitarian Geneva Convention, disarmament uh, treaties, uh, of which the US uh, uh, and our allies are signatories. And we haven't really looked very closely, I think, at how uh, these international uh, uh, treaties uh, affect what we think we might be able to do with some of these uh, interventions. Um, fascinating stuff going on in neurobiology. Bill Casebeer was one of the organizers of this meeting back in December. Uh, from the wet lab up to political science and anthropology, um, uh, is it possible to make sense of uh, either individual brains or, the, or those of uh, ethnic groups, of cultural groups, uh, using the tools of neurobiology, of neurogenetics? Uh, this is, this is a, a fascinating. This is on the web, this white paper. I commend it to you uh, if you want to see some of the options that are being uh, examined. Very speculative, but very, very provocative. Uh, the National Academies of Sciences have done three recent projects uh, since the original publication of Mind Wars. Uh, I was involved with a couple of these um, on the counterintelligence and neuroscience, on army opportunities in neuroscience, on, on the field evaluation of behavioral uh, cognitive sciences-based methods and tools. Uh, all of these are on the web, uh, and they all evidence the fact that uh, the national security community, the counterintelligence community, is very interested in uh, the possibilities of neuroscience both uh, for ourselves and to be aware of what the other guys might be able to do. Um, so uh, this, just a couple of examples here. Uh, this is that uh, report on, uh, on uh, emerging technologies in cognitive neuroscience. Uh, the client was the DIA. I think it's very important to note that uh, these are being paid for by national security agencies. Uh, and that, I think, in itself speaks volumes. The National Research Council's report on army opportunities in neuroscience included a discussion of transcranial magnetic stimulation. Perhaps you could put uh, a transcranial magnetic stimulator in a vehicle, with, uh, have a soldier, uh, a driver with uh, sensors on. If he or she is getting tired, you might be able to give him or her a zap in the right place at the right time. That's easier said than done. You have to focus the thing in the right way at the right part of, this, of the cranium. Uh, but uh, this is reported out uh, by Floyd Bloom and colleagues from this committee as uh, on, the, on the shelf and possibly doable within a decade. Uh, and I'll, then I'll just uh, mention this to you, kind of lower tech. This is the so-called uh, preliminary credibility screening system, assessment screening system, the PCAS. This is basically an old-fashioned lie detector technology applied uh, to a finger. Um, very interesting, at this workshop in 2009, September 2009, you had the, uh, the engineers on one side saying, oh, this really doesn't, this isn't that great. Uh, and you had the national security people saying, we need whatever you've got. Unless you tell us it really doesn't work, we're going to put it in the field because we need these devices. And what's especially attractive about this is, as one of the trainers put it at that workshop, which was public, um, you can teach a 20-year-old soldier to use this in 20 minutes. Uh, and it has three lights on it. Uh, right. Green light, yellow light, and red light. So um, it was also mentioned at that meeting by one of the trainers that this is being used as one of the measures to screen locals for employment in the green zone in Baghdad. Not the only measure. He wouldn't tell us what the others were. Uh, but this is actually being used in the field. And one of its uh, virtues is that uh, even though it might not be very effective, uh, very accurate or reliable, it's better than the voice screen analyzer, which was really useless. So I want to stop there just to give you a sense of what's been going on uh, since the first edition of Mind Wars. I want to thank my colleagues, my many colleagues at Penn, uh, people in this room, been a big influence on me, uh, and a number of... Uh, organizations as well, and thanks also to my research assistant, Mike Tennyson, who has a poster uh, being exhibited at these meetings, who helped me this summer. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to transition to uh, Dr. Giordano.
first. A couple of apologies right off. First of all, I was trained as a neuroscientist, so I spent an awful lot of time at the bench. And second of all, this isn't a speech impediment, this is a New York accent. So if I fall into a bit of jargon, or if you can't understand the accent, please feel free to raise a hand or ask me a question afterwards and say, I just didn't understand something about that. You know, since Professor Moreno's book came out in, in the last decade, there's been an awful lot of interest in this topic, and of course this isn't a new topic. Our role at the Center for Neurotechnology Studies at the Potomac Institute was really to take up the mission of the old OTA, the Office of Tech Assessment of Congress, we're a decongressionalized branch. And so what we really do is we look at those neurotechnologies that are available now, some of those that are older, and some of those that sit right on the horizon of possibility and really try to discern what you can do and can't do with them, what are the capabilities and limitations, and then based upon both capabilities and limitations, what should you do and what should you not do? So the real maxim here, for those of you who are philosophers in the room, I was going to subtitle this, how do we virtuously shave with Occam's razor while trying to sail in von Neurath's boat? And the idea there is simple. It's basically a question of this stuff is going to happen. So let me be very, very clear to start off. A lot of my work has actually been funded in doing this. Professor Moreno just referred to a, a recent paper of mine with my research associate, Rachel Wurtzman, who's in the audience, that talked about the possibility for the ways that extant neuroscience and neurotechnology can, in fact, be weaponized based upon an existing survey of the field internationally, not only what we're doing in the States and what our allies are doing, but an international survey. That paper took over two years to pull together. Some of the information was not available for public dissemination. Others is, and it's available for you now. You can go to the Cynesis website or just look me up. It's one of the papers we just have out. But this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with this field, neuro s and neuroscience and neurotechnology, and basically is defined as the field moves forward. It's to engage these cutting edge capabilities to assess, access, and up, you mean, manipulate human performance whether used in a medical setting, whether used in public life, or certainly whether used in agendas of national security, intelligence, and defense. But there's a historicity that goes along with this, which is very simple. I, too, like Professor Moreno and like Professor Casebeer, I'm a student of history in many ways. I don't think that one can come through the field of neuroscience without recognizing its historicity. And much of science and technology since antiquity has always been employed of those agendas towards national security, inclusive of public health, defense, and ultimately, some form of weaponization. So the issue here is that neuroscience and neurotechnology, like any science and technology, not only holds capability, but in reality is not just potential, but is truly possible and in very many cases actually being translated into these type of things that Professor Moreno just told you about. Are we doing it here in the United States? Well, certainly. Are they doing it elsewhere? Yes, they are. Are our Western allies engaging in research that examines the possibility, potential, and applications of these? Yes, absolutely, but it goes further than that. One of the things that really is important for us to understand is, and I want to really be clear, this is a position that I advocate. We really shouldn't use science and technologies in ways that are deleterious or harmful. Absolutely. The idea that many neuroscientists, many scientists, many engineers, many ethicists maintain a north orientation on their moral compass that says it's absolutely opprobrious to utilize any form of science and technology in ways that might harm, that's undeniable. But let's not confuse ought with is. In fact, we do use it this way, and as a consequence of that, it also dictates a stand not just of a precautionary principle, but one of preparedness. Remember, the issue is really what can be done. Let's, let's parse through the neural nonsense and recognize not the fantasy stuff of time warps and dealing with dinosaurs as atomic bombs and time travel beam me up, but the stuff that's out there now and moreover the stuff that exists as the potentials and possibilities within a five-year window of technological evolution because that's really the concept to articulation gap that we're finding with. So what we really see here is that neurotechnology will in fact be used this ways, and that really, at least for us, bespeaks the need to surveil, to understand, and to try to parse the capabilities and limitations, and from that, lay down guidelines, governance, both ethically and with regard to policies and laws, what can be done, what can't be done, what should be done, what should not be done. And the principle is fairly simple. Very often what we deal with is the notion of certain things being reversible. What are the effects? What are the side effects? And uh, many people confuse the fact that these types of technologies may be rendered by research programs that are not stringent and rigorous. No, 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 we impugn that. These things all have dual use, and we need to understand that. 
And also public health is part of national security, and there is viability there. And military agenda also deal with things like military medicine. Certainly the trauma and insult of war weighs heavily, both on the national consciousness and certainly on the national economy. Well, this is the same type of agenda. But this is something we can't do. We can't simply say, well, I'm just going to fold my hands underneath myself and not be part of the debate. My urge, my challenge to each and every one of you is certainly adhere to that moral compass that says we really should move towards the aughts, but at the same time we need to recognize what is. Moreover, the thing we want to avoid against is the fallacy of double harm. And one of the problems we have with neuroscience and neurotechnology is the ease and facility by which it is accessible. Many of these things are available off the shelf. In fact, one of the things that our paper really wanted to demonstrate is that there's a range of extant neuroscience and neurotechnology that is immediately weaponizable. What do you think? I'm the only person who thinks like this? Kay's Beer's the only guy who thinks like this? Rachel Wurtzman is the, well, maybe she is the only person who thinks like that. But aside from that, these are easy. It's not a nuke. This is backyard, build-it-yourself stuff. And then once you link it with other technologies like nano and cyber, Ladies and gentlemen, that cat can get out of the bag very, very quickly. And there's a real issue to this. Obviously, there are also dedicated efforts, not only on the part of countries such as the United States and our, and our allies, but without being the least bit alarmist, part of our survey demonstrated that there's a lot of stuff that occurs both over the wire and under the wire. Those individuals, both agents and actors, as well as nation states, that are truly dedicated to weaponizing these types of things are using them in agenda that may not necessarily be an overt combat weapon, but certainly gives something of at least an economic edge with regard to leveraging the healthcare scene, viable neurotechnologies, and then swaying the public health in a variety of ways. And there's a viability of these uses in several applications that we need to be aware of and we certainly need to be prepared for. And one of the issues that comes to the fore is that I highly, highly mandate the fact that if we look at the United States' history of science and technology, we have as a nation, both philosophically and practically, assumed something of the moral high ground, and we should not stop. However, the moral high ground at the same time does not compel or sustain the idea for us to sit on our hands and remain unprepared. In fact, the argument here is that the, the real action of the body politic is the protection of the polis. And if, in fact, the ease and facility by which neuroscience is readily translated into a variety of applications and not under large governmental programs that require gazillions of dollars, but can make this then leverageable in those ways that really threaten the construct, as many of the posters I saw last night, are, of humanity, well then, yeah, we should assume the moral high ground, but do so in a way that is prepared, because if we sit on our hands, and don't surveil, and don't maintain a research agenda that allows us to really parse what can be done, what can't be done, where the threats are, and how to mitigate particular threats, then that very lack of capability and very lack of investment, such lassitude, may in fact be opportunized by agent actors in nation states that look to then leverage that in such ways that threaten the security, defense, and probity of those things that we hold dear. Look, ladies and gentlemen, I have to tell you, I mean, the last thing in the world I am is an alarmist. However, I am a pragmatist, and I think in this particular case, a doctor, dose of Dr. Dewey's pragmatism is well taken. So my argument is as follows. I think that there is, in fact, a need for neuroscience and neurotechnology in a prudent, capable, and responsible national security, intelligence, and defense agenda. If nothing else, a combined and dedicated research effort that is on surveillance and overview of what can be done and what should be done what is being done and what may, be need, what may need to be done to mitigate against particular harms and threats. That's a large agenda. Certainly it needs to remain competent, this idea of mind melding and knocking down goats and like time, that's ludicrous, that's neuro nonsense. And in many ways what that then does is that ramps up public misperception, misapprehension, and what we then see is the Janusian face of expectation and anxiety, and that's wrong. Obviously, this stuff needs to be stewarded by responsible scientists, ethicists, philosophers, the judiciary, and the body politic. And it must remain committed to this research agenda, both scientific and technologically and ethically. If, in fact, we're going to assume the moral high ground as consistent with the philosophical character that bespeaks both constitution and history, then obviously failure to do this is indeed succumbing to the fallacy of double harm, and I, I choose not to do that. In practicality, the issue that comes up over and over again is, well, what do we do with the level of transparency? Look, 
I'm going to paraphrase a quote from the late Vince Lombardi. It's very difficult to win the game when you show your opponent your playbook. And in fact, if one of the things we seek to do is to maintain a scientific, technological, economic, and perhaps security and defense at least equal hand in the game, then some non-transparency is going to be essential. There may be needs for those projects that exist at the secret level, top secret level, and sensitive compartmentalized levels, simply because the information and technology is nascent and may be very, very abusable. But that doesn't mean that those projects that are conducted under those agenda should be any less rigorant, rigorous or stringent, both scientifically and or morally and ethically. In fact, just the opposite. What I urge is not simply a signatory writing away and saying, no, we shouldn't do this. Yes, I agree with that moral compass. However, be a player in the debate. Come to the table. What is needed is the individuals of just like you to be participatory in that larger level of discourse that helps to decide what, when, and how. Moreover, the question of if may be a moot one because the decision of if these things will be employed and utilized may not be our own. How then do we stance that research agenda to remain well prepared and operationalized? I advocate a stance called prudence parentalism. What prudent parentalism is is striving for the moral high ground. How might we do this? Well, regulated transparency, certainly. Dedicated surveillance, frank public communication of process, and relative progress. But here, too, I mean, I think there really does need to be some stewardship. And stewardship goes along with the obligation and responsibility of professionalism, both of the scientists and certainly of the ethicists. You can't tell everybody everything for a number of different reasons, not the least of which is that there may be some real problems with that. And some of the problems exist to the fact that we need to remain prepared, not just precautionary. And some of the problems with regard to frank communication include things like misperception, misapprehension, public fears, and certainly the fact that it's very, very difficult to insulate against the way the information is used. Uh, you know, the idea is if you don't want the neuroscientific information to get out there, then don't publish it. But once published, once out there, once disseminated, we certainly have some level of obligation and responsibility to inform the public of what's going on, why we're doing it, and the nature and conduct of what's being conducted, even behind closed doors. Details? Not necessarily. Because there is some prudence with regard to playing certain cards close to the vest, at least perhaps at first. How that process actually evolves? Well, this is a work in progress and evolution. I wish I had answers for you, and certainly we're trying to work with that by advancing the National Neurotechnology Initiative and working with our governmental colleagues. But it's discursive. It requires some level of standpoint cosmopolitanism to sort of engage that discourse. And moreover, it's not just a question any longer of an ethic that's the West versus the rest. We recognize that the scientific, engineering, and technological capabilities on the worldwide stage as such, that economic as well as national security policy, intelligence, defense agendas, as well as public policy, need to be leveraged and acknowledge the fact that there are not only other countries that play a very strong role in this, but very, very much the idea that increasingly those ethics are important. A simple precautionary principle won't work. So what I advocate is a dose of Dr. Dewey's pragmatism and a healthy dose of Berentian philosophy. A pragmatic address, what can we really do, what can we not do? Not knocking down goats in time transport, what can the technology do and what can others do with it? And from there, what should we do? What's to fix? The philosopher Hannah Arendt took a very, very good look at the way humans engage their activities. She did it from the stance of a Delphic pillar of wisdom. Know thyself, know thy limits. Humans can work in one of two ways. They can put their head to the brimstone and just slave away, and suddenly before them looms up a golem, a monster, and they say, what have I created? Or we can be homo sapiens technologicus, what she called homo faber, the ingenious creative human that has the reflective and moral pause both before, during, and after the creation of all things we invent or innovate and implement. And indeed, that's what I advocate, a stance of preparedness that engages personnel just like you in pragmatic analysis, pessimism, and certainly moves towards policy and prudence, establishing groundwork questions, and perhaps developing new systems of ethics that are far more internationalizable, certainly more flexible and recognize that indeed neuroscience and neurotechnology has the capacity not only to change the human condition and predicament, but certainly human society, and perhaps the way we conduct wars, and what that might mean. My hope is that hopefully we can then work together in the future to do this through an ongoing discourse with organizations just like this. My father was an engineer, and he used to sit me on his lap when I was a little kid, and he used to say to me, Jim, measure twice, cut once. 
because sometimes there's no turning back. My father was a very bright guy. Thank you. Thank you, and now, finally, uh, took the chance to be here. Thanks very much for the introduction, Fabrice. It's a real honor and a pleasure to follow uh, both uh, Jonathan and uh, James on this panel. Um, so uh, it, being in the presence of people who are thinking deeply about ethical issues and the application of neuroscience and national defense is uh, a pleasure because these are important and pressing issues and I appreciate the intellectual labors you've both put in uh, to, uh, to helping give this field some depth. Um, and I should acknowledge, of course, from the get-go that the content of my presentation, its thoughts are entirely my own, not those of any other entity, government or otherwise. And insofar as there is anything just true and beautiful in this presentation, it's because of mentors I've had in the past, like Pat Churchwin, who it's a pleasure to see in the audience, name you heard from last night, whom I studied with at the University of California at San Diego, and people like uh, Martha Farah, who were helping us carve neuroethics as a, a new field out of, out of rock. The, the title of my presentation is Neuroethics and National Security, The Promise and Peril of Neuroscience Technology with the Hopeful Coda. And uh, I think there are many people who have a stake in the intersections of neuroethics and national security. Here are three different groups uh, who have a stake in how these things uh, are merged. Uh, on your left, uh, you see a, a member of uh, the Toreg, uh, a um, uh, ethnic group that lives in the Pan-Sahel region in North Africa. Uh, this gentleman may eventually have to make a decision about whether or not he throws his lot in with groups that want to peacefully resolve their differences with the government of Mali, or groups that instead want to use violence to resolve their political disagreements, such as the Salafist group in combat, which recently changed its name a few years ago to Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and the reason that this has something to do, his position has something to do with neuroscience and national security is that he lives in an environment where people influence his behavior by doing things like telling him stories, uh, delivering narratives to him that shape his perceptions of what group he's a part of, what groups he's not a part of, and what means are acceptable to use to resolve disagreements between those groups. So there's something going on neurobiologically there that we need to understand if we are perhaps to uh, shape our interactions with groups like this in a way that makes it maximally likely that we'll reach a peaceful um, resolution of our political disagreements. This gentleman in the middle uh, will uh, face both the promise and the peril of the intersections of these things. The war fighter deployed in Afghanistan, uh, I believe this is a, a, a reservist. Um, they will need these types of technologies to do things like help them deal with cognitive overload, which happens on the battlefield quite often. Uh, our warriors, war fighters, uh, face a complicated wartime environment. They were asked to do many things that they wouldn't have been asked to do 50 years ago in terms of interacting with populations, such that they have to pivot on the one hand from being precise and lethal, uh, to on the other hand acting as de facto uh, sheriffs and mayors of towns, uh, provisioning goods and services, uh, serving as critical key negotiators in many contexts. So just a, a wide swath of things that we ask our strategic corporals and airmen to do for us in the battlefield. And neuroscience will uh, help complement the innate strengths of this uh, uh, complicated neural network that exists inside our skull, um, but also present some uh, perils insofar as its misuse could lead us to harm uh, the very people who are charged with protecting us. On the third hand, we also have people who may stand to benefit from the development of technologies that spin off of research at the intersections of neuroscience and national security, such as this uh, child who is an MAOA mutant. So that's uh, uh, someone who has a mutant, a uh, problem at the tail end of one of their X chromosomes such that they lose a gene sequence that codes for the production of an enzyme that catalyzes or eats uh, serotonin which is an important neurotransmitter that affects things like mood and impulse control. So uh, it may very well be that some of the research that, help us, that helps us help the warfighter and helps us protect people like this from being exploited by those who don't respect the autonomy of individuals will also help uh, people like this lessen the operary likelihood that they might wind up in jail because of an inability to control violent impulses, for instance. So lots of stakeholders in this debate. <clears throat> 
And that concludes my presentation. No, I'm just joking. Let's go back to the first slide. There we go. And I know, Fabrice, that we're pressed for time now, so I will, uh, I will keep this brief because I'm, I'm very concerned that we have lots of questions and discussion. So I won't cover all of this, um, but I'll, I'll move relatively quickly through my slides. I wanted to tell you a little bit of what about I mean by neuroethics and national security. Link that at least to one, to one phenomena in national security that's important, namely the uh, process of radicalization. That will let us set us up to talk a bit about principles we've used in the past to resolve moral disagreements about what we ought to do while fighting warfare. Um, then I will uh, lead into some general comments about a ethical framework that we can use to help uh, guide our uh, deliberations about what ought to be permissible, what ought to be permissible. Uh, like Dr. Giordano, uh, Giordano, I'm an optimist and a pragmatist, and I hope to convince you that it's not uh, insane to be one as well by, by the end of uh, my 10 minutes with you. So in, with this audience, sophisticated audience, I don't need to tell you what I mean by ethics. Uh, it means something like a science of norms in the loose sense, an organized body of knowledge about what we ought to do or think or about what kind of people we ought to be. It's normally captured by the big three moral theories that you'd find in any prototypical ethics survey course, virtue theory, deontology, and utility. Or another way of thinking about that is it's uh, axes along which you can evaluate the moral, moral dimensions of any problematic situation. Namely, uh, does, the, does our decision making in that situation conduce to our flourishing? That's virtue theory. Um, are we doing something there that violates uh, rights that we possess by virtue of being agents and the duties that are the flip side of rights? And finally, does our action have good upshot? Does it produce good consequences? So this is captured by uh, the reasoning of people like Aristotle and Plato in the virtue theoretic camp, Immanuel Kant in the deontic camp, and John Stuart Mill in the utilitarian camp. There are many, many ways you can combine neuroscience with ethics, uh, multiple uh, senses of the term application. So we can do applied neuroethics, which is really what I'm going to be doing today. I think thinking about how neuroscience sheds light and how, on the, uh, how we make moral judgments and on the nature of morality itself is also equally fascinating, but not something I'll be discussing today. So today I'm really going to focus on neuroethics as the systematic study of how the cognitive neurosciences interact with issues in applied ethics, wrapping that around the national security axle in its broadest sense, the actions we take both individually and collectively to defend ourselves. And it might very well be that when we consider ourselves as a polis, we get certain permissions to do things that we would otherwise not be licensed to do, uh, depending on the context. So that will let us talk then some about just war theory. One interesting national security issue to which neurobiology might speak is the process of radicalization. So this chart captures the work of people like uh, Paul Davis at RAND uh, or Troy Thomas and myself who take a systemic view of radicalization, namely that there are certain inputs that lead to certain conversions of mindsets such that you get organized groups out of them uh, whose existence is then reinforced by the actions perhaps of, or inactions of uh, a state. And the only thing I want to footstomp here is to note that there are multiple places in this ecology where stories and narratives play a critical role, ranging from the identity cleavages that identity entrepreneurs like Abamel Guzman, uh, the founder of Sendero Luminoso, a Maoist uh, terrorist group in Peru, pick up on so as to mobilize individuals to convince them they ought to either implicitly or explicitly support the cause. That's interesting because there is a large body of neuroscience work on the effect of stories and narratives on our neurobiology. So you're probably familiar with this diagram. It's from Josh Green's work that's over a decade old now, right? So uh, from uh, the journal Science um, that highlights how the frames we use to set up the way we reason about morality can influence our fundamental judgments, including those about whom we think it's permissible to kill. Right? So this is the infamous footbridge and trolley problem that you're probably all uh, familiar with. And uh, Green discovered that the types of moral personal scenarios that resemble the footbridge problem are far more likely to bring online parts of the brain implicated in emotional reasoning, uh, theory of mind-oriented structures uh, that uh, make us especially sensitive to the interpersonal harm we'll be doing in a context. Whereas if we describe the scenario in terms of the trolley, where it's more impersonal, long-term consequence oriented, then we bring online areas associated with working memory. So the footstop point here 
is that it's very difficult to draw a principal distinction between these two cases. We try to do it as philosophers by talking about the killing versus loving die distinction, but there's independent psychological evidence that isn't explaining why we have differences of intuitions about what we ought to do in the footbridge uh, problem versus the trolley problem. So uh, Green's work provides us a nice explanation of why it is that about 80% of you, if I were to survey this room, would say it's permissible to push a switch to divert a train onto a track to, that would strike only one child rather than the five, but only about 20% of you would say it's permissible to push a child into the way of a train to prevent the train from striking five other children. So a very interesting neurobiological explanation for why a story frame can have a powerful impact on our moral judgments. So if we're going to study that scientifically, we needed something like a theory of story. Here's one from Gustav Freytag, a uh, 19th century German writer who um, regurgitated Aristotle to point out that stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end. A setup, a climax, and a resolution. So you can tell a, a simple story in three sentences. Uh, it may involve something like what you hear from uh, Lebanese Hezbollah's television station. So uh, Al Minar has been broadcasting for over 20 years now, and some of the uh, commercials that are aired on that station have a setup, climax, resolution structure where they say things like, the setup is that the neo-colonial powers unjustly established the state of Israel, the climax is uh, we, militant Hezbollah, resist violently, and the resolution is that Israel is pushed into the sea. So similar types of in-group, out-group distinction drawing are probably what explains why uh, we see um, icons like this present uh, outside of uh, the Grand Mosque in uh, Bamako, Mali. Uh, this is an illustration of uh, a Palestinian youth who was purportedly killed by Israeli defense forces in uh, the early 2000s, Mohammed al uh, his father defending him. Um, this uh, looks like an attempt by someone, we don't know whom, uh, to generate surrogate consciousness on behalf of West African populations for the Palestinian flight, even though the connections culturally between, between the two groups are rather tenuous. Now, uh, ideally, if there were to be a, a, a politically salient conflict that might arise out of these types of in-group, out-group distinctions, we wouldn't have to use violence to resolve it. But if we did decide as a polity that violence is justified uh, in response to it, we'd probably use something like just war theory to help guide our deliberations. And here we distinguish between the justice of the war, so as the war itself justified, use ad bellum, and the justice of the things we do in the war, use in bello. Uh, I won't step through these. This isn't a checklist. I would just point out that there are connections between these common sense tests that we apply uh, to ensure that our application of force is, uh, if not justified, at least permissible, um, that share connections to those major moral theories I reviewed about uh, eight minutes ago. So we can then draw upon those to ask, how can we use neuroscience-related technology in a, a similar justified fashion? So here I think we can use the three C's test. So kind of like you use four C's, maybe five C's if you count chemistry, to evaluate diamonds. So we can ask on the character front, does using the technology make us less functional as human beings or develop bad character traits in us somehow, advert to virtues and vices? We can advert to consent. Does the subject of the technology consent, uh, both uh, implicitly and explicitly, we have to do a lot of unpacking here, to having it used, so considerations of rights and duties are paramount. And finally, consequences. Did the good consequences of using technology outweigh the bad? So if we ask these questions that can capture a lot of our moral concerns, oftentimes these will all agree and we could license the use of the technology. Uh, think of a technology that perhaps augments the ability of our intelligence analysts, for example, to uh, rapidly identify objects in overhead imagery and, and photographs that are coming down from airplanes and satellites. Presumably an entirely unobjectionable uh, use of neuroscience to help improve our cognitive capacities, uh, make us better at doing things that we need to do if we're to actually make violence less likely. Thank you. So uh, while there are a lot of difference between uh, battlefields of the past and the future, um, I do want to point out that uh, just war principles and the moral theories that inform them um, can be applied even despite those differences and that a lot of the worst case scenarios that we uh, imagine with regards to these three uh, uh, dimensions, character, consent, and consequence, are really science fictional. 
uh, and that they don't speak to the way in which the technologies are actually applied in the battlefield. So I'm uh, reiterating uh, James's point from uh, uh, his uh, last presentation. And Kevin Warwick, of course, was one of the gentlemen that Jonathan Moreno had in his chart, uh, the, the, the cyborg. So uh, certainly things we need to be concerned about at the tail end of these spectra, but we need to keep in mind that uh, in terms of what's actually being done in the real world, most of the concerns are at the left side, if you will, ones that we can uh, reason our way through using traditional tools. I want to end by pointing out that we're not at sea in a sieve, that the uh, traditional tools of moral judgment and evaluation that we used in lots of other contexts still apply even in the cases of national security and neuroethics. And that sometimes these differences are merely ones of degree, not of kind. We already manipulate each other's neural states, day in and day out. We do it in ways that are both rational and irrational. Rational by offering you structured arguments like the one I'm offering you now. Irrational and irrational uh, by the fact that my gestures, my appearance are also going to influence the, the functioning of this complex cognitive system. And we need to keep in mind that Defending against intrusions into autonomy, preserving those things that Kant would praise as a value, uh, requires an understanding of some of these uh, basic mechanisms so that we can mount an effective uh, neuro defense. Um, and that restraint itself, in terms of research, also presents strategic risks when potential adversaries aren't proceeding in a transparent and democratically deliberative manner as we are when we develop these technologies. Oh, in there, so we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you, yeah. Trace. Yes, yes, yes. I know we're running out of time, it's 10.30, but uh, we have two microphones. Why don't we spend five, seven minutes for questions? Yes. Uh, hi, uh, Will Salatan from Slate Magazine. I have a question for Professor Giordano. One of your slides about, uh, talked about the practicality requiring non-transparency. And there were, I think, three or four rationales up there. There was the obvious one, which was exploitation by hostile groups. And then there was misperception by the public. Mm -hmm. And I forget what the third one was, but it was related to some kind of misapprehension. Mm -hmm. So of course, this set off all my alarms. Is, can you give an example of uh, some area of research where misperception by the public would be grounds for non-transparency, apart from exploitation by potential exploitation by hostile groups? Deception detection using functional MRI. Uh, there are some very interesting things that can be done with some of the more incipient areas of advanced functional MR together with other forms of co-registration. Professor Moreno alluded to some of those. With regard to being able to parse out visual images, it would seem as if one is scanning the brain to read the mind. That's actually not what's happening at all. The visual system is organized in a particular way. That information, when that then gets out to say, well, we're working on X, Y, or Z, very often becomes far more of an ampliative argument if it is either miscommunicated or misperceived. The problem we also have is that very often these are, in fact, incipient findings that may then be built into sort of a larger research agenda or may be dropped. So it can be very, very alarming for the public to hear, oh, my gosh, what you're really doing is you're seeing exactly what I'm looking at or you're seeing exactly what I'm thinking. That's not the case at all. In other words, that, that's a bun that really shouldn't come out of the oven yet. It doesn't necessarily mean we shouldn't be baking it and taking a look at it and see, well, is this going to work or is it not, and where do we go with it. But the early release of information sometimes, particularly if it's oriented towards a national security or defense orientation, can be very, very uh, misleading. And sometimes that can actually induce panic. And the other area where this comes up very, very frequently is a far more contentious and provocative area, which is the use of neuromicrobiological agents, for example, something that uh, Rachel Wurzman and I discuss explicitly in our recent paper. And of course, this has been dealt with over and over again, and there certainly is international convention, and these are all signatory conventions. However, we're also aware that there are a number of individual agent actors in small groups that are existing outside the United States that are actually examining some of these. So ongoing work that looks at potential mitigating factors, anti-venins, antidotes, et cetera, developing particular antibodies might, in fact, if inappropriately communicated, then ramp up the idea that, well, now you know, the United States is working in neural viral weapons, et cetera. So again, I think that the, the prudent communication is very important. And the problem we have, unfortunately, is that we're also dealing with a technology in which Open access to information can be misconstrued even without misintent. Uh, the very technology that allows us to have rapid access to the World Wide Web and open access publications and journals is such that 
the public can also have access to that. So there's a responsibility on the part of the scientists and the part of science writers, like Mike Kors is in the, is in the audience, uh, and you. And so I think that the level of responsibility is greater now. It really is greater. And early release can be very, very difficult to manage, particularly, as I said, once that's out of the bag, then it's a question of managing misinformation as well as misappropriated information. hope my answer was satisfactory. Okay, just for the sake of time, short answer, short question and short answer. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you for an interesting panel. Uh, Joe Finns from Cornell. Um, you know, one of the things about John Dewey was he said, you know, recognition of the problematic situation leads to his theory of inquiry. Mm -hmm. And, and I, would, I would suggest in following this, the, the gentleman's question from Slate that the, the problematic situation hasn't been adequately parsed, that mm -hmm. there's a whole dimensionality sure. to, the, to, the, to the implications of the work and a, and a, and a problematic space vis-a-vis -vis what this kind of work has, what kind of impact it has on the legi legitimate uses of neuroimaging mm -hmm. and other neurotechnologies. And, and, you know, I think, you know, that the hyperbole is inevitable mm -hmm. and, and uh, about the fears, and we have to be edu educate people about the legitimate fears, but, but in a sense, you know, the threat has also been ramped up. And, and you're actually, uh, Professor Giordano, are talking about an argument for pre pre uh, preemption. Uh, in other words, of preemption. Of it's kind of a preemption, preemption. argument. Preemption, yeah. That, you know, that there's this possibility that these bad guys might be doing things. And it kind of contradicts, the, the, I think, what the strongest premise in Jonathan's book at the very end was the importance of sunshine, that, that you, know, you can't have it both ways. You know, he argues that the best way to regulate what you all may be doing or thinking of doing is that we cast sunshine and there is transparency. But then again, if you have transparency, the bad guys have the advantage. And in a sense, you're arguing for a preemption. And we know what the last preemptive war did. You know, it undermined authority. And I think this is it in a kind of nano or micro you know, uh, space. So Dewey's theory of inquiry, the larger impact on, you know, because I, I do MRI, work with MRI all the time. Right. Families are, see this stuff, he says, you, you can't even tell me whether your, my loved one is going to recover from the minimally conscious state, but, you know, I'm reading the things in Slate, you know, or Discovery about what these imaging technologies can do and, and, and you know, we can, we can identify terrorists at the airport, things like that. So the balance, preemption and the like. Can I just say, I'm, a, I'm as big a fan of Dewey as anybody in the room. Uh, but he had a real problem with applying his pragmatism to national security contexts. He, uh, he was uh, a big supporter of President Wilson in the First World War and then very disappointed with the outcome of the failed League of Nations. And then he, uh, he was a fence sitter in the Second World War. He, he actually never advocated American involvement in the Second World War. Sure. So uh, he's uh, iconic to me as he is to probably everybody up here. Uh, to you, Joe, but um, it's very hard to know how to define the problematic situation. Dewey, in his own life, wasn't able to in the context of, na of national security. I apologize for the people who want to ask uh, questions, but we're going to have to stop here, take a 10-minute break, and we're going to start sharply at uh, 10.45, but please join me to thank again our panelists. <laughs>